desktop show for that. Yes, that looks good. All right. All right, I'm going to ask everyone a poll question. I want to learn a little bit more about what is important to you. And do any of these issues I'll be describing uh, apply to you? Uh, we'll ask a poll and please answer everyone that applies to you. So do you live in a home that perhaps in the summer, the upstairs is very warm and or in the winter, it's very cold in another room. So uneven heating. Is that, does that happen in your home? Uh, perhaps you have a furnace that is old and noisy. It has been upgraded for many, many years. Or winter time's coming. Do you dread opening that utility bell, given this is really the first initial cold weather that we've been having since the beginning of the year? Uh, or do you have perhaps someone in your household that has asthma or allergies? Or do you have maybe something like it's damp and moldy in some rooms or in some section of your house. Or maybe you're a new homeowner. You bought the house and nothing has been upgraded since the original owner. Uh, everything's original for that. Or maybe I just want to save energy for that. So we're going to bring up a poll question for everyone. And please, if any of these apply to you, please check those boxes for that. And I guess we'll give it about a minute for people to answer and then once hopefully we'll get a good sampling and we'll take a look at that. All right, how do the uh voting look right now. Good. Yeah, I think we have um, most of the participants answering, maybe just a few more seconds and uh, I'll go ahead and close it and share the results. All right, thank you. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. All right, let's see. So roughly about 40% have issues with uneven heating in your home. Looks like that. Exactly half have an old furnace for that. This is actually a good time for just discussion about furnaces, given the cold weather. Uh, yeah, about a third of you have high utility bird bills. And then let's see what we got. Um, about another third have concerns with indoor air quality. Uh, perhaps they have asthma, someone has asthma or some sort of underlying lung condition for that. And then let's see, a uh, small percentage of you, about a fifth of you have some issues with molds for that. And then uh, about a third of you have homes that have not have had no upgrades for a while. And then I'm glad everyone's here to look at saving energy or carbon reduction for that. That's really the important thing. All right, so let's take a look at some of the things that are done with that. So thank you, let's clo close the poll and let's move forward. So many of these things that you have describe those problems. They all relate to something that's common problems in our homes. Uh, it could be something like a damp crawl space or moisture in the attic, a uh, drafty room, uh, perhaps excessive dust in the home. Or you might have, if you have an older home, you might have got condensation on your windows. Uh, with moisture, you've got mold or mildew or just old inefficient equipment. So let's take a look at uh, how we can solve many of these issues. Uh, we call this home performance. It's sort of an approach to help, help making your home better. And the key underlying part of home performance is that we take what's called a holistic view of homes, that everything in the home is interrelated to each other. It's like your furnace has a duct system. If you just upgrade just the furnace, but you never touch the duct system, you're not getting the full benefit of that new furnace for that. So we look at the home holistically and look at all the systems because they all are they all uh, inter uh, interrelate to each other, that changing one thing affects the other, and that you want to understand the whole impact of any changes in your house. So all these problems that you described that you have, there are solutions for them, and they all have an impact on your whole house, whether it's what we call the envelope, which are essentially the walls and ceilings of your home, and everything that goes inside of it, all the equipment for that. So solutions that we'll talk about are, Air sealing, 
insulation, duct sealing, high efficiency heating and cooling, and also water heating uh, for that. How well do you know your home? Have you ever taken a look in the attic or in the crawl space? Uh, you know, most people don't, but there are things in those locations that can impact your comfort. You know, how is the insulation installed in your home? Do you have any insulation in there? Uh, perhaps uh, for those that have like al allergies, are there pests like rodents or perhaps you're dealing with dust mites for that? Uh, perhaps the wiring has not been upgraded properly or been left exposed, which makes it a fire hazard for that. And then duct work that delivers the warm air to your house in the winter and cool air if you have air conditioning in the summer. What is the condition of your duct work? Uh, this is a picture of a duct run, and this is a duct joint where this is a wrapped fiberglass. That black band, that fiberglass is, same, is the same type of fiberglass that's used for your filters of your furnace. And it's black because it's been collecting dust leaking out of this duct system for many years. So that's heat that would normally be heating your house is now actually warming a crawl space or a basement, not your home itself. And we're all spending time at home now. You know, with the pandemic, we're all spending a lot of time in our homes and there's a concern more of indoor air quality from that. There was a study done in the late 1980s by the Environmental Protection Agency or EPA. That study revealed that indoor air quality in your home is typically two to five times worse than your typical outdoor air quality. So today, you know, the air is pretty good. Indoor air quality is two to five times worse than what is considered typical outside air, which is considered the reference for indoor air, for, for air quality for that. The exception, of course, is the wildfires. You know, that changes the whole equation. But under normal days, uh, normal air, the indoor air quality is considered worse than outside air. And that study also said that we spend 90% of our time in buildings. It's either at home, at work, or at school. Right now, it's pretty much all at home. And an important part of that study that they also revealed, uh, and other things, is that children, they're more susceptible to indoor air quality issues, uh, that you know, they have a smaller body and their lungs are less developed. So the issues like excessive dust in the home impacts them, uh, perhaps uh, the pest or excessive moisture. If do any of these have something that's in your, going on in your home? So managing indoor air quality, we have, this is only touching the very top of it. There's many more aspects of indoor air quality, but the few that are addressed through home improvements. Uh, one is what we call the home envelope, the ceilings and your walls. If you improve that, that improves your air quality of your home, but also improves your comfort at the same time. Uh, the other part is what contributes to poor indoor air quality. And these are mainly the appliances in your home, uh, the gas appliances in your home. Uh, one of the big ones is, do you have a gas stovetop or gas oven? Those are direct appliances that combust gas directly in the air of your home. That um, this is a contributor to poor indoor quality if you don't use your uh, vent hood of your stove to vent out the cooking when you're cooking, or at least open a window. Uh, natural draft water heaters. Uh, this is pretty much what everyone has in their home. Uh, when they first start up, there's a brief period of spillage, and if the vent wasn't designed properly, it could be putting the exhaust of the water heater into wherever the water heater is located. Is it in a closet? Is it in your garage? Or maybe in the kitchen of your home, based on the age of your house. And of course, old furnaces. If there's an issue with the heat exchanger, that could allow carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, which is an odorless uh, poison, uh, into your home. So let's look at how some of the aspects of home improvement um, can improve the air quality as well. As I mentioned, the first one is air leakage. Uh, I sort of call this the secret sauce of uh, home improvement, is that people don't understand how air leakage in a home can impact both the air quality as well as uh, the comfort of your home. So if you look here on the image on the left, you know, this is your typical house. And you know, this is the space where people stay in the middle part but the spaces where you don't live, uh, the attic, it's dusty. Perhaps you have a damp crawl space or a musty basement, or even 
an attached garage to your home. But the air quality in these locations are not considered good air quality because if you go in there and you smell musty, damp, you already know there's something wrong with the space. You want to flush the air out for that. So where you live, definitely it's important to air seal the connections to your attic, the ceiling, or anything that connects to the crawl space because where do the plumbing pipes go? The sewer pipes go down through the floor and into the basement or crawl space if you have that. Those spaces are considered less desirable and even your garage. What do you put in your garage? Do you park your car? Do you store chemicals in your garage? Those areas have poor air quality in your typical house. So you definitely want to air seal your house from those spaces. And then the other ones, which is, which is based more on comfort, is you know air that leaks through a door or window. So for me, when it looks to indoor quality and performance of the home, you want to seal the ceiling of your house and anything that connects to the crawl space, even through the walls for that. So air sealing is an important part of air quality of your home and uh, the comfort. And then you consider the outside walls when it's, for instance, when it's wildfire season and you know you had your wall doors and windows closed, but you smelled the smoke coming into the house. You know, those are the leaks from outside leaking into your home for that. So understanding air leakage where you apply that air, air, air sealing is an important part of the overall comfort and efficiency of your home. And with air sealing, insulation is also an important part. That is the thermal layer. That's what holds the warmth in your home. That is the insulation in poor condition. So for instance here, this picture here, is the insulation even in contact with the floor or the wall? Or perhaps in your attic, there is no insulation up there at all. It's not doing anything to hold the heat in your home. What you want is you want an even layer of insulation after you have a good air barrier so that it's evenly applied across the whole surface. That is what will make your home more comfortable. And in fact, air sealing and insulation go together. They're complementary to each other. Uh, think of insulation as a sweater. It keeps you warm, but if you ever stepped outside like today, and it's just a little draft of wind, you can feel it go right through the sweater. How do you stop that from losing heat? You put a windbreaker over that sweater. That is what will help keep you warmer. So same thing with insulation in your home. It's that sweater wrapping your house, but you need to protect it from air movement. So air leaks from that. So air seal and insulate together is an important thing for not only in the air quality, but also the comfort in your home. Another part, important part of your house, the duct system. The, what delivers the heat during the winter and the cold air if you have air conditioning during uh, the summer. You know, over here on the left, you know, what's the condition of your ducts? You know, it's funny, people have this thing called duct tape. It was never designed for ducts, it turns out. You have to use a product that's either a metal tape or what they would call a mastic, which you'll see over here. It's like a white, very thick uh, paint type product. That's the proper way to seal ducts today. You know, so do you have poorly connected ducts? I uh, mentioned before duct leakage, either leaking out the uh, conditioned air. The proper way is to seal those ducts. Uh, what's interesting is uh, the California Energy Commission did a study on California homes and they found both new and old, they found the average home leaked 30% in their duct system. So can you imagine for every dollar of heated air that you pay for, 30 cents of that is heating the crawl space or the attic, not your home. So 30% duct leakage is the average in California. So that's something really to consider about your duct system. Ventilation, not directly related to uh, uh, home uh, comfort, but it's an important part of indoor air quality. In your bathroom, do you have a bathroom fan? Or in the kitchen, do you have the stove that vents outside? Those two rooms, bathroom because you take showers in there, it just generates a lot of steam. In the kitchen, you, you're cooking a lot. So there's the water from the boiling process. There's the oils from cooking or sauteing. All those are things that get into the air of the home and you wanna get those out. So using these ventilation fans and using them when you need it, when you take the shower, when you're cooking, even just after you turn off the, the, the burner, it's still gonna be generating some of that steam. You wanna vent it out for a period of time. 
So that's an important part of indoor air quality. Use these devices that are in your home. If you don't have them, at least open a window. Uh, this picture here on the right, that's mold right against the wall. What's happening here? Not directly related to ventilation, but there is a relationship uh, to this. This wall is an exterior wall. It's not insulated. And this couch was right up against the wall. What happens here is that because this couch was blocking any warm air from to the wall, moisture collected back here. And when you have moisture, you get mold. Uh, think of this as like you take a can of soda out of the fridge. What happens after a few minutes? You get water droplets on the outside of that can of soda. And that's what happens to cold surfaces near home. So a single pane window, an uninsulated wall. If it's cold and there's humidity in the air, it is a chance of mold buildup on that or moisture and then eventually mold. In this situation, because the couch was blocking any warm air from heating up this uninsulated wall, they got moisture and with that mold growth. An important thing to think about uh, molds. Uh, think mold needs three conditions of growth. Think of it like a tripod. It needs a food source. So that's anything organic. It can be clothing, it could be uh, materials, paper, dust. Second, it needs the right temperatures to grow. And unfortunately, molds have a very wide temperature range to grow. Uh, they grow most efficiently in our human comfort range, which is 65 to 78. So they love to grow in that temperature. And in fact, um, if you have leftover foods in your refrigerator, and what happens after three or four weeks and you leave it in the back of the refrigerator? You get mold growth, right? And that's pretty cold in the refrigerator. It's only if you freeze, you know, literally at zero, <laughs> that you don't get mold growth. And we don't want to live in that condition. And then lastly, molds need moisture to grow. And of those three, which one can we control? They'll eat anything organic. They grow at a very wide temperature range. And moisture. Of those three, the one that we can control, have most control over, is the moisture that's in our home. And that's measured through uh, using a hygrometer. So basically, a weather station checks temperature, checks what we call relative humidity. If you have this issue with mold, think about how those surfaces are perhaps colder and how those can be warmed up. It could be insulation. It could also be managing the moisture in your home. One is recognizing some of these things that's happening here. And then down here, this is a crawl space. The crawl spaces can be a source of moisture into our homes. Uh, this is a dirt crawl space. Uh, many homes that have that uh, in, in you know, San Mateo area. And this is what's called a vapor barrier that's been added afterwards to seal the moisture down into the crawl space. And I want to tell you a story. Um, my aunt, uh, she lives in Redwood City. And in her home, she has a dirt crawl space that was constantly damp. And her children always had allergy issues. Uh, so part of the diagnosis of her home that we uh, learned was that there's excessive moisture in her crawl space. And because of that high humidity, it got itself into the home. The ultimate solution we did is part of what we did was air sealing the house and adding a vapor barrier. And that vapor barrier prevented the, the crawl space from getting damp or high humidity, which then kept the house drier. And the end result of that was a more comfortable home, a drier home from that process, and less allergic flare-ups for her children for that. So that was the end result of doing that. And, you know, you, this is San Mateo County. There's all different climate zones. There's on the coast side, you know, if you're at Half Moon Bay area, you've got coastal damp weather. If you live more on the bay side, you know, you've got some parts like Redwood City, Redwood Shores, that's very close to the water and that you're dealing with a high water table that can introduce moisture into the home or that. So one is understanding some aspects of this, of your home and what's impacting the comfort and the health of your home. All right, let's move forward then into the other appliances in your home. And these are ones that probably you have in your home. You may have what's called a natural draft style water heater. You can tell by a metal vent pipe right here. This is where exhaust can potentially spill into the home during the first period of when this water heater turns on to heat up water. And then if the vent pipe is poorly designed, 
Uh, I've tested homes where there is, ex you know, literally exhaust spilling into the space of where this water heater is located. And that is carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, nitric oxide, so all these different byproducts that's just not good for the air quality of your home. And of course, an old furnace for that, that these are things that you probably have in your typical home. And there are solutions for improving this. One of the paths is electrification, is changing these appliances away from natural gas. Uh, there are now efficient products on the market to consider as part of this path of, of improving the air quality and efficiency of your home. This is a picture here of a heat pump water heater. Uh, this is uh, what's called a ductless mini split as a way of heating and cooling your home. And then Bayman is actually offering rebates for replacing some other gas appliances in your home. If you have a gas stovetop, uh, there's, we have a rebate available for induction stove cooking. This is not your resistive electric stove, but induction cooking uh, is a very efficient, quick way of cooking foods now for that. So an induction stovetop, perhaps you have a gas clothes dryer. There is now a heat pump clothes dryer, which is very efficient at, at drying clothes for that. So let's take a look at some of these newer technologies. Uh, that can help the uh, efficiency and air quality of your home. I'm checked, Tony, you have about five minutes for your okay, great. presentation. All right, so for heat pump water heaters, uh, these are three to four times more efficient than an electric water heater. And you have a heat pump in your home, actually. Uh, the way the heat pump water heater works is that it extracts the warm air out of the space and heats up the water. The refrigerator in your kitchen, that is a heat pump also, it, but it's taking the heat out of the refrigerator and adding it to your kitchen. So it's making your refrigerator very cold. For a heat pump water heater, it takes the heat out of the air and warms, heats up the water. And then the output is a cooler and dehumidified air for that. So that's a heat pump water heater. For heating systems, this is very new, but this is an option perhaps is that it has, especially if you have like something like a wall furnace, uh, there is uh, an outside, compressor unit, but then there's indoor uh, head units that uh, will output heat and cool air if necessary for that. And there are ceiling units, uh, wall units, and uh, low floor units available for that. So there's a heat pump, ductless mini split heat pumps that are available for heating and cooling homes now. So how do you get started? We have the Home Plus program. So Bayron Home Plus has several parts of it that can help you. Uh, we have, an, on our website, we have an online evaluation where you can get a free energy efficiency kit. So this is something you can get now for that. We have energy advising. We have in cash rebates that can be offered by our participating contractors. For the energy efficiency kit, if you go to bayrenresidential.org and you take the online survey, and share your utility data so that we can help analyze your energy usage. You can get free LED light bulbs, a smart power strip for your television, and water saving devices like a low flow shower head and aerator. The energy advisors, call them for any questions you have. They're here to help provide information. They are technical experts on the program and can help you determine what contractors to reach out to if you have any particular issues that we described, that we checked in earlier for that. So they can also analyze that uh, energy savings when you share utility data and help you find out where to make improvements to your home if you don't know where to get started. Uh, briefly, our participating contractors, they're here uh, to help do the installation and apply for the rebates for you that we offer through the program. Uh, they're trained in building science to understand many things we just talked about earlier, like good air sealing, the proper appliances, proper improvements to your home, and that they handle all aspects of submitting for rebates. So let's take a look at a couple of sample of rebates for that. So we go to the Bayren uh, webpage. You can sign up for the energy efficiency kit. And if one of the advisors, if you can post the link to uh, the measures list uh, on the chat box, there's a whole range of rebates available to you, but let's look at a couple of these that could be a, you could perhaps apply to your home. And the key thing is these will be installed by a participating contractor and they would submit for rebates for you. So let's look at two sample projects for it. 
this is one where we're doing an installation improvement. You get a thousand dollars. It's seventy-five cents square foot up to a thousand, up to a thousand dollars. So this will maximize for fifteen hundred square. Foot, will maximize the installation rebate. Remember, I talked about the duct leakage. We have a duct measure saying that if you can reduce it to five percent with duct replacement, there's eight hundred dollars rebate. So that's only five cents of every dollar lost through duct leakage. Uh, upgrading your heating system. You can upgrade to a heat pump now if you have the right uh, equipment to be replaced. We can give you up to $1,000 incentive for that. A combustion safety test is to help check and make sure all your gas appliances are safely operating in your home if you have them. And this is a bonus at the end of our program. We had a jumpstart program that normally by doing a, a heating measure, cooling measure with insulation, we normally give you a $500 bonus. But until the end of next month, so you have one month from now, if you are ready to do an insulation and a heat, heating or cooling improvement to your home, we have an extra thousand dollars added right now for doing a combined insulation project with a heating or cooling measure. So the potential rebate available is $4,450. Another aspect, uh, perhaps you have an air conditioning system that's wearing out and that typically the, the air conditioning portion wears out sooner than the the heating portion of most systems. So perhaps you need to be upgrading your air conditioning unit. Uh, do we have an $800 rebate for upgrading to a high efficiency air conditioner? Of course, if you're upgrading your air conditioner, you wanna fix the ducts. So replace them and upgrade another $800. And then also we have a heat pump water heater. So if you are replacing an electric one or you wanna switch away from a gas one to an electric heat pump, there is $1,000 available from the Bayren Home Plus program. And uh, I'll just give you a note, but uh, later on when Carlos talks about some programs from Peninsula Clean Energy, uh, he also something that actually would be very complimentary to a heat pump water heater for that. So I'll let him talk about that when it gets to his section. But just for Home Plus, there is $2,750 potentially available to you if you upgrade your air conditioning and your heat pump water heater. And then lastly, I'll just mention on the measures, if you have a gas stove top, and you want to get away from a gas stovetop because when you cook with a gas, you get things like carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, nitric oxides, and aldehydes. These are air pollutants that come into your home when you turn on a gas stove or a gas oven. These are indoor air quality issues. Uh, and they found with a study with children, most children had, had, that had allergy or asthma conditions lived in homes that had gas appliances. That, that was a strong correlation between the two. So getting rid of uh, a gas stovetop or gas oven, there's a rebate if you switch to an induction stovetop. And then a gas dryer, we have $300 if you replace it with a heat pump clothes dryer. All right, on financing, quickly. Different ways you can pay for these improvements. There's the traditional, put it on your credit card and get points. Perhaps you have an equity line of credit. So these are your traditional ways of paying for improvements, if you, especially if you want to do multiple together. There are two products available to you that are what we call green loan products. One is called the Residential Energy Efficiency Loan, or REAL. Through many, many of our participant contractors offer it. I, th I think there's a green credit card. It applies, it's based on your credit score and it can be applied toward energy efficiency projects. So this is one way to finance, very similar to your credit card. It's based on your credit score. The other is called PACE, Property Assisted Clean Energy. This is based on the equity of your home and it's done through an assessment through your property tax bill. So it's just like a loan product, but it's paid through your property tax bill. So it's added onto your property tax on the payments for it. But it's another way to finance green projects or even solar for your home. On complementary programs, just wanna talk about Home Energy Score. This is another Bayron program that's there to support you that if you want to know more about your home, uh, Home Energy Score uh, essentially scores your home on a scale of one to 10. If you get a 10, you have great, you know, your home is pretty in good condition. If it's five or less and you're uncomfortable, that indicates problems in your home that you probably need to get up, some sort of upgrade or improvement to your home. Uh, but even a great score, like if you get an eight, but you're still uncomfortable in your home, there's probably some other underlying condition that needs to be looked at uh, for that. But the home energy score is a great way, especially if you don't know much about homes, to get a quick understanding of what's going on. 
And so if you go to homescoreca.org, you can look up for different assessors and there's a $200 rebate available to help discount getting a home energy score. Uh, the last program I'm gonna talk about is, um, this is from a, a, a program on the East Bay called the Rising Sun. Uh, they do two programs. One is they help people transition into uh, the construction industry through apprenticeships called Opportunity Build. The other is called Climate Careers. This is a program for or youth, high school students that are interested in getting into the green industry from that. Uh, the program they run is called the Greenhouse Calls. The way it used to work, although it's pre-pandemic, is that they would come to home with a, you know, come in, look at your home, help install energy efficiency things like light bulbs, smart power strips. And then they help you follow up through education of how to find ways to improve your home. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, the program had to change a little. It's now based pretty much done everything through calls or online. Uh, there's an online survey you complete or you can call on the phone and they have Spanish speakers available. You get a free energy efficiency kit sent to you, very similar to the one that we offer through uh, the website and the Bayren Residential, and then follow up to help you with that. And uh, this is the link to their program, uh, risingsunop.org, programs GHE, Greenhouse Calls, for that. So how do we get started with this? We have an advising service and we have a few advisors here today, uh, Kimberly and Danny. If you have questions, they might answer it on the Q&A for you, but you can call us right after this webinar, 866-878-6008. You can call and talk to an advisor. You can go to the Bay Ren Residential website to look up more on the program. You can help use our contractor, find a contractor tool under the resources tab. You can look at the project measures list of the rebates available through our program. And with that, I am gonna pass off the baton to the next person. Thank you, Tony. That was a great presentation. I especially keep remembering your analogy with the sweater and the windbreaker, and that kind of helps me um, think about the building envelope. And um, so thank you. And attendees will be sending out the, um, we'll be sending out the slides to you at the following the workshop. So um, this, you'll get this information shortly. So now we can turn it over to Cynthia with um, San Mateo County Health. Cynthia, you're, are you there and can you share your presentation? Okay, I'm going to move Cynthia to panelist. Okay, Cynthia, let me know if that works for you. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Great. Thank you. I was ha I lost VPN for a while, and so I had uh, checked out. That's a bummer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, well, thanks for joining us. Sure, I'm going to share my screen. So good morning. So do you see um, strictly my presentation or do you see the notes as well? We see the notes. So if you could toggle up to the display settings and do the present or do the okay um, the top here. Yeah, I think on the left, at least I'm seeing it on the left, um, display settings. I see um, my presentation. Okay. Let's see. So yeah, there morning. we go. Yeah, that looks good. Great. Good morning, everyone. My name is Cynthia Knowles. I am the Healthy Homes Program Coordinator at San Mateo County Environmental Health. And I work primarily with uh, families in multi-unit buildings. And I uh, reach out to families on a regular basis 
through community, um, through home visits and, and community workshops. Um, and I address a substandard housing issues and most of the issues that I, I address that I encounter with multi-unit uh, families um, are pests and mold. So I'm gonna focus on that today. And I'm gonna be, I'm gonna try to be as brief as possible. Um, thank you, Tony, for that very um, articulate and uh, uh, thorough, detailed background. You, basically, what I'm going to show you is conditions that I have observed and some of the problems and, and some of the solutions. So let's start with mold and moisture. So we heard some, some very good information from, from Tony and how moisture can intrude into a building. Um, so here's what I'll call the four questions. What is mold? How does it grow? How can mold affect us? And what causes mold? So um, first I have um, a poll and that is, um, do any of the participants um, have mold issues or damp areas in their home? I just launched the poll. All right, I think most have voted, so I'll give it a couple more seconds. All right, I'll share the poll results. Okay, all right. So some have and some haven't, but a majority looks like um, have. So um, I'll ask the question, what is mold? What is mold? Mold is, um, and Tony gave us some background, but mold spores really are generated from decaying vegetation. And so we can't necessarily um, avoid mold spores. They are in the air and they aren't necessarily harmful until they meet um, a, a wet, uh, humid surface. So how does it grow? Uh, Tony gave us some background on that. It needs a, um, a nutrient source, um, such as any organic matter, wood, um, cotton, linen, leather, um, vegetation. And it needs, it needs um, uh, that moisture in the air. And when you combine that nutrient source and the moisture, you can, and you have excess moisture, you can, mold can grow. So how can mold affect us? Mold can affect us, um, can cause respiratory issues. Um, it, if someone is susceptible to um, uh, reactions to certain allergens, sometimes mold can, um, can cause an allergy. It can actually cause new asthma. It can trigger an asthma attack. But generally, not, not, it isn't something that um, everyone is affected by, but some people can be allergic to it. And it can cause respiratory issues when, when mold is in high count. And, but it's not something that um, we need, we don't need to be concerned about counting mold spores because when you see mold, you know that you have it and you have to address the source. But it doesn't necessarily, because if you see something that's black, it's black mold and it, it it can kill you. That is not something that you need to be overly concerned about. The Department of Public Health does not, the California Department of Public Health does not advise that, that we measure mold spores in the air or the types of mold. We need to address the source and get to the bottom of it. Um, and really what causes mold? Well, what causes mold is excessive moisture. So here's a little bit more information about um, the, the adverse health effects. As Tony mentioned, the optimum relative humidity in a home 
measure by the hygrometer is between 40 and 60 percent. And so anything outside of that range, say a lower percent humidity or a higher relative humidity, uh, can, can cause health problems. And I usually focus on families that have respiratory issues, um, asthma, um, and uh, sinus issues. And so you can see on the right side of the graph, um, certain bacteria, if, if relative humidity is above 60% or 70%, you start seeing the growth of bacteria, viruses, fungi, which is the mold and the mildew. And um, you can see allergic rhinitis and asthma. I many times work with families that have increased asthma episodes because of mold. So let's get back to what causes mold, moisture. Um, I will briefly show you some uh, examples. We'll just look at um, drips and leaks, condensation, what's happening in your kitchen and your bathroom, and, and Tony really already went over crawl spaces, so I think that's sufficient. Um, we'll just look at some examples here. On the left is an example of what was a faulty downspout that caused a leak inside a home. So you, it's hard to see on the left side, but the floor had to be torn out. In the middle is a lack of water flow underneath the home. This was a single family home. And on the right, you can see that there was a, this issue was the scalloped nature of this mold was the result of a faulty, a faulty uh, gutter. So next we have um, some sources of moisture it would be um, when condensation or just vapor intrusion. So the, the photo on the left is actually wall sweating where there was no, absolutely no furniture up against the wall. There was no, there was no, nothing pushed up against the wall. It was below a window. And so moisture can intrude when you have warmer air on the inside up against a colder exterior wall, for example. And if there is no insulation, generally you're going to have mold, whether there, you may have mold, especially if there's furniture or appliances pushed up against the wall, which is the middle picture. That's just the backside of a piece of furniture that is pushed up against the wall and um, uh, excess lack of airflow, lack of ventilation, um, and the, the high humidity caused the mold. And on the right side is, that is um, a bedroom that had um, mold stains on this wood and there was a lack of ventilation and potentially moisture intrusion by just what I'm um, describing where you have this warm air on the inside and cooler air on the outside when that warm air meets that cool surface surface um, that's when uh, the condensation and, and excess generating excess moisture allowing mold to grow. So let's look at a little bit of condensation when we just, by the act of breathing, um, cooking, bathing, when that warm air on the inside, that, that generates moisture. And when we have that sort of more, more um, greater amount of uh, warm air on the inside meeting that cold air on the outside, that you can have condensation. And it, it's not just on windows, as I mentioned, it was on the, the wall that was actually sweating. And on the right side is a bathroom with a wooden ceiling that has no ventilation whatsoever, no window and no fan. So here's another example of, of a window that has condensation. And on the right side is just, it's a small example, but you can see how, where when there's a lack of insulation and you have excess moisture on the interior meeting and that generating that warmer air, meeting that cooler exterior wall. That, that is an example of an exterior wall, but on the inside. And there was mold stains all around um, this, uh, on, on the two exterior walls in this bedroom. Well, Cynthia, just maybe um, move towards a wrap up in the next minute or two. Thanks so much. Okay, so we need to increase ventilation um, get that airflow increasing. Don't worry about losing heat. 
Um, increasing the airflow for five minutes, 10 minutes a day is fine. You, you really are, um, you need that air exchange. Um, increase your airflow. Don't be afraid to use the heat. Many families are. Um, consider a dehumidifier. Try not to dry clothing indoors. Dry any wet surfaces. Very important to dry any wet surface, especially those windows and those sweating walls. We're going to move on to pests, and I'm going to go really quick. Um, how about pests? Or, uh, and that's the second part. Has anyone observed pests in their home? I see most most respondents. Okay, just another moment. All right, I'll close out the poll. Great. Okay. Well, I'm more than offline. I'm more than happy to answer your questions about any kind of pest. But let's go through this very quickly. Um, what's very important. There's four questions again. What's very important to, to, to ask yourself is where are the pests hiding? Get to know their patterns. Survival, why are the pests there? How do the pests enter? And how can we keep them out? So, integrated pest management is really just a function of safer pest control without sole dependence on the use of pesticides. So we're looking at treating the cause and not the symptoms. We're looking at uh, what's, why are they surviving? Is there food? Is there moisture? Where are they hanging out? Where's their heart? Where are they harboring? And how do they get in? So where do they hang out? They're in cabinets, appliances, around showers, tubs, and toilets where there's high moisture. And they're also in the exterior of your home as well. Let's look at where they're hanging out. They're cozy at the end. This is a picture of um, in uh, you know, 99% of my home visits, I find that majority of the cockroaches are right around the motor of the refrigerator, behind and under the fridge. So those flecks, those um, specks that you see on the left side, that's, those are cockroach droppings, which, are, which is frass. And that, that, um, uh, that is an allergen. That is an allergen. On the right side, it's difficult to see, but you can see the egg casing. This is under an old refrigerator. So they're taking refuge there, so you need to get in and clean that area. That the roach droppings, um, incidentally, the juvenile roaches can feed themselves, feed them. It's, the roach droppings of the adults are nutrition for the juvenile roaches. So that's why we need to get the, the frass cleaned up. Um, where do they hang out? They're hanging out in the cupboards. Um, these are pictures of also in the, um, in the hinges of cabinets and cabinet drawers on the right side. That's the, the frass is the indication. Uh, why are they there? Um, food sources, moisture, clutters, where they can take refuge, and also used appliances. Um, we've got food. These are, all of these photos are from home visits. And so it's very important to containerize your food uh, safely, uh, either in the refrigerator or in plastic containers. Plastic bags won't protect you. Uh, moisture attracts rodents. Um, and, and cockroaches. Uh, we've got leaky um, drain pipes. We have leaky or um, malfunctioning garbage disposals that cause moisture and attract pests. On the right side is just an example of a, a, a sink counter seal that has um, become deteriorated and that causes uh, the stains you see. That can cause stains and heavy moisture underneath your kitchen sink where a lot of pests love to hang out because it's dark and it's warm. Also, how are they getting in? They're getting in through behind sinks and cabinets. Uh, well, actually the stove is where they're hanging out. <laughs> the baseboards um, and around any um, gaps around your shower and the tub and the toilet. So on the left is just a, 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 a remodel where a cabinet, a cutout was uh, used to, or the um, outlet was cut out of the cabinet but it wasn't sealed up. In the center is an, uh, just an electrical outlet. Uh, roaches love to come 
hang out behind the outlet and also um, uh, come in through. And on the right side is a new remodel of a cabinet that is, is poorly installed or poorly built. And it's got an opening, it's got a, a gap where roaches can easily access. So IPM is prevention. We need to keep it clean, keep it clutter free as best as you can, ventilate, uh, use your fans while you're bathing and cooking, get that air flowing, keep it dry. Don't push any, any furniture or appliances up against the wall. That's, that's where you're decreasing airflow and moisture is, is increasing. And you need to practice pest exclusion. So you gotta seal them out. So here's an example of a clean area behind a refrigerator. Get behind that fridge. Uh, keep it clean by using least toxic uh, cleaning products, which we can talk about um, in the future. Uh, I generally don't advise um, the use of bleach for uh, attacking mold or any kind of um, uh, for cleaning since it, it emits a chlorine gas. And I rely on diluted vinegar, hydrogen peroxide, liquid soap, baking soda. Um, just reduce clutter and containerize as much as you can. These are examples of families that decluttered their closets, uh, had rodents running around in the closets and high moisture. On the right side is a family that was heavily affected by rodents but containerized and, and controlled the problem. Here's just an example of some pest exclusion uh, on the um, utility, the, the water um, utility connections don't have an escutcheon plate over them. The escutcheon plate, the example of the escutcheon plate is the, in the middle, but on the left and the right side where the utility connections are, the water lines are, you can see a backing rod with some silicon caulking and then an escutcheon plate on top would complete that process. And then the outlet down below is, is not cut out, but it has a plate and it's secure. On the right side, you can see an example of a backing rod and some caulking uh, that has sealed that gap. Well, Cynthia, um, I think we'll, we'll kind of have to move on to the next presentation, just okay. uh, making sure, yeah, the next speaker can present, but I'll put my email address in the chat and um, any attendees can follow up with me if they have to drop off, um, I can, okay. Um, connect you with any of the presenters today and also um, this kind of the presentations will be recorded so I'll also leave a link to our YouTube page where it will be posted and kind of share the content and where you can um, revisit the content. So I think I'll go ahead and um, pass it over to Carlos with Peninsula Clean Energy and I'll actually be sharing um, recording the slides. So. Great. Perfect. Well, thanks everyone for taking time out of your Friday morning uh, to learn about these topics. Um, and thanks, uh, Denise and DeBayron, for putting on this presentation. Um, so, uh, a little bit uh, hard to segue from cockroach droppings, but I'm going to try my best. <laughs> um, so, uh, my name is Carlos. I'm a community outreach specialist with uh, Peninsula Clean Energy. Um, we're going to mainly cover two things today. One is a quick introduction on who Peninsula Clean Energy is, um, kind of a, a big, broad overview of what we do. And then second, um, there's lots of ways uh, for you to save money on electric products right now. And we have rebates that range from um, electric cars um, to portable backup batteries and um, heat pump water heater program that's coming next year. Thank you. Um, Okay, so we were launched in 2016 um, with the goal of reducing carbon emissions um, and to expand access to sustainable and affordable energy. Uh, if you can move forward. Great. And the way it works is uh, we all know PG&E. PG&E, they own the power lines um, and they, they distribute the energy. What we do is we work on the back end. So we uh, uh, come up with the electricity sources. We sign long-term contracts um, with solar, wind, other vendors. So we decide what the sources of energy are. PG&E delivers that energy. And for you, um, there's no change. The only thing you'll see now is that uh, there's a line item that says Peninsula Clean Energy. But basically um, what we do is PG&E used to do everything. They used to do the generation and the delivery. 
now they only do the delivery. Continue. Great. Um, so real quick, this is, uh, people ask us all the time, where does our energy come from exactly? Um, and uh, everyone receives a mailer in the, uh, in the mail um, with, with exactly what our sources of energy are. Continue. Great. Now residents have choices for where they get their energy. Everyone is automatically defaulted into the Eco Plus uh, product that we offer, uh, which is 50% renewable energy, 95% carbon free, plus it's actually less expensive than what PG&E was offering. Um, you also have the choice of either going 100% fully renewable, um, and you can do that on our website. Um, you just indicate that you're interested and it's about four more dollars per month for the average customer, or you can opt out and go back to PG&E if you choose to. Okay, so the other thing about us is we're a local a public agency, so we don't have any shareholders, so we reinvest all of our earnings into public programs. Um, and some of those programs are, uh, these are the three ones we're, we're mainly concentrating on. One is transportation, so we're offering rebates for new and used TVs. We're offering free test drives for weekend rentals, um, which I'll talk about in a sec. Um, then there's uh, uh, resiliency, which is mainly about, you know, we're having all these shutoffs due to the PSPS events or fires or any number of reasons. So being able to still have power on uh, and not rely so much on the traditional grid is something we're, we're working on as well. And the last thing is moving to all electric buildings, whether that's through reach codes, which is trying to, uh, which are code standards in order to, to to achieve that cities are going through right now to go through all electric buildings or, or more electric buildings, I should say, and also offering the training for, for, for contractors um, to do that as well. Okay, we'll just skip right past this one. Okay, so bottom line numbers, um, $18 million is what we expect uh, to combine annual savings for all the customers in San Mateo County. Um, in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions, it's estimated 144,000 metric tons are saved, which is the equivalent of removing 30,000 cars uh, for, from the road for a year. Okay, and yeah, more, more bottom, bottom line numbers, um, 18 million annual savings, and we're also, we have a goal of uh, 300 megawatts of additional new renewable energy projects. Um, so we are signing new contracts for solar places, uh, for example, Wright Solar in Merced County, that's specifically for uh, uh, San Mateo County residents. Okay, moving on to our programs. Um, Tony had touched on this uh, a bit, but we are going to be offering a heat pump water heater program, um, which is expected to launch on January 1st, 2021. Um, so there's a lot of benefits with this. Um, bottom line numbers is we're expecting about a thousand dollar rebate, which uh, is not, not set in stone. It could actually be higher. Um, but that's just a straight rebate for the water heater. We're also offering incentives if there's any kind of uh, upgrades that, that you need uh, for installation or panel upgrades if they're required uh, on top of that. Uh, and we're, we're partnering with Bay Ren uh, Home Plus program that they already have ex uh, existing. So uh, it's going to be as smooth as, we're trying to make it as smooth as we can. So it's a single application. You can layer incentives on top of that and you'll have access to the energy advisors and participating contracting contractor network. Okay, um, so this is uh, EV incentives. We have lots of EV incentives. Um, the first one is EV test drives. So we wanna give people an opportunity to test drive what uh, an electric car is even like. So we're offering a EV rebate rental of up to $200, which is about, depending on the EV, you choose two to three nights um, of, of an EV. Uh, and this can apply anywhere. So uh, whether it's Enterprise or Turo, um, you can check out an EV for two nights and on our website, we have a form for you to uh, get a rebate for that. 
Uh, second, we have rebate for new electric vehicle purchases. So uh, it's basically up to $700 for, uh, sorry, those numbers are reversed. So it's up to $700 for a plug-in hybrid and $1,000 for an all electric car. And that is time sensitive. So that ends at the end of the year. Plus uh, you must be a first time EV buyer in order to apply. And the last one is a used EV rebate. So right now that's an income qualifying program. So your income has to be up to, it's a, approximately $100,000 for a family of four. Um, but we have th that information on our website. And uh, if you uh, apply, uh, you can get up to $4,000. And again, you can stack that. There's other rebates that we have on our website as well that you can stack that on top of. Okay, last thing, um, energy resiliency. So um, as I mentioned, we wanna have uh, people be able to still access power if there is a shutoff. So the two main programs, one is for homeowners. So if you go through our vendor, which is Sunrun, um, they're offering a, a 1250, uh, 1,250 rebate on solar plus storage systems. Um, the question we get all the time is, you know, what if I already have solar and I just wanna, focus on storage. Right now they do not have a program just for storage, but that will be coming um, in the next year. Um, and the second program is for renters and for income qualifying homeowners. Um, so this is for any renter or if your income is up to a certain amount um, and you're a homeowner. So what we're offering there is that if you uh, apply for that and you live in a high fire threat district, so this is, think of this like, um, like Montero, Pescadero, um, part, Half Moon Bay. Um, if you live out there and you're a renter or income qualifying homeowner, we are offering a free portable backup battery. So this is a, a portable backup battery that's about $3,000. It's the, uh, a Yeti battery. And this can power uh, you know, medical devices um, for a uh, you know, one night to up to multiple nights, depending on what the program is. Um, and for this one, if you even have like a CPAP machine, that would, that would, uh, you'd be eligible for that program as well. Great. Well, thank you. Um, really appreciate everyone.